the second part, yeah. which is entitled Characterization and Estimation of the Key Rank Distribution in the Context of Side Channel Evaluations. Mm. Uh, the authors are Daniel Martin, Brooke Knapper, Elizabeth Oswald, and Martin Stem. Mm. by look. Mm. Okay, that's cool. Starting from the beginning. Okay, so this is a joint work with my colleagues from Bristol, Dan, Elizabeth, and Martine. Um, and the general theme for this talk is uh, how to do side channel evaluations better. So the claim I want to make uh, is that we're not evaluating the resistance of a device to uh, non-invasive types of side channel attack, such as uh, DPA, as well as we could be. So hopefully I want to convince you why that is and what we can do about it. Um, but first, just to kind of motivate this, why this is important. Um, so resistance to these attacks is encoded in several evaluation processes already. If you're manufacturing to a certain level within FIPS 143 or uh, Common Criteria 3.1, uh, you have to give evidence that you're, you're resistant to these kind of attacks. Uh, there are billions of devices out there that uh, have to or should be um, following these, these uh, security uh, guidelines. And the reason why an accurate evaluation in particular is important in this case is that SCA is almost always probabilistic in nature, so sometimes the attacker gets lucky. And as evaluators, we need to be able to say uh, with some confidence how lucky that attacker can be. So the underlying motivation uh, uh, for this work was uh, there's been a recent trend in literature which suggests that we need to change how we view the outcome of our attacks. So I'll circle back around to what I mean by that. Um, but the rough plan for this talk would be to explain how we do attacks at the moment, how we evaluate at the moment, and then how we need to change our view to include something that we call the rank of an attack. And then consequently, how we should modify our evaluation strategies to, to include this, this uh, notion of a rank. OK, so a very, very like 10,000 foot view of a side channel attack is, is this. You have an adversary that needs to gather measurements um, that we call traces. It needs to be power consumption, EM radiation. Um, and the attacker hopes that those measurements contain some information leakage on the secret key used by the device. Then the attacker has to essentially define their strategy. And that consists of two main things. The first thing is a model for the leakage um, for the device, and that model can be guessed, derived, estimated. Um, but in general, the adversary hopes it quite matches, it matches well what is going on inside the device. And the second thing the adversary needs is what's called a distinguisher, um, which is essentially just, a, just a, an overloaded term for a statistical method or an algorithm that compares the model leakage with the, with the real leakage inside the measurements. So when the attack is run, you have a a key spit out, which is the, the attack's best guess for what the key is, which the adversary can check using a known plain text or cyber text pair. And in this, in this current model, if, if this key is incorrect, then that's failure. The attack's failed. You have to start again. So I quickly want to discuss what affects success for, for an, an adversary. So some things are kind of systematic. If the adversary doesn't model the leakage correctly or picks a distinguisher or a technique that doesn't quite capture the dependencies in the leakage, then the, the attack's not going to do as well as it could do. Um, but there's also random sources of error. Um, there's environmental noise, there's countermeasure noise, um, and maybe measurement quality also matters. So the way uh, evaluations happen at the moment um, is what I'd call an attack-based approach. So if you're a manufacturer and you have a device, you'll give uh, an instance of the device with the crypto deployed on it to, to some uh, 
some guys in a laboratory, which can be internal or external. And using their kind of best knowledge, their best expertise, they'll define a list of attacks, and they'll run those attacks on the device and see what happens. And if they all fail, if they all don't produce the key, then you're going to conclude the device is secure. If one succeeds, then you kind of judge its strength uh, quantitatively, uh, which in general, I mean, there's a few properties assessed, such as the amount of time uh, the adversary took, how much money they had to spend. Um, but, but the kind of the big one is how many, how many traces, how many measurements uh, the adversary needed to get. Uh, because these are time consuming and expensive to acquire. Okay, so back in 2012, um, some guys at, at, uh, at SAC noticed that the, the adversary doesn't need this attack to be perfect. And they essentially defined a, a strategy for the adversary in which the adversary does the exact same thing as before, same measurements, same attack configuration. Uh, but they essentially, and I don't want to go into the detail as such, but they essentially described a method uh, for the adversary to make use of some auxiliary information contained in the, in the attack result. And the, the adversary does some what we call enumeration work. The adversary is able to essentially assign a score uh, that's associated with the likelihood of all the key candidates being the correct one. And once you've done this, you're able to check the key candidates in order of their score. So essentially, actually, I think a good way of viewing attacks in this model is, is essentially a, an enhanced brute force search. You assume the adversary is going to check keys, and you assume that the side channel information, uh, what it gives you is, is a bit an ability to check keys in a, in a cleverer order than just randomly. So going a little bit more formally, we. Uh, say the rank of an attack is the number of keys the adversary has to check before it hits the correct one. So I have a kind of really simple uh, illustration on the slide here. Let's assume we're attacking a, a block cipher with a 128-bit key. The adversary does this, does this enumeration step and generates the keys in order of likelihood, checks, um, keeps on going until they find the correct one. So in this example, the, the rank of the attack is 2 to 57. And the adversary has to enumerate and verify that many keys. I want to point out that this is absolutely not the same as doing two to the 57 executions of AES. There's a lot more work involved. Um, a kind of to give a rough idea, what happens is an, an attack produces several lists or several subsets of information that give information on the likelihood of certain portions of a key. And the adversary has to kind of be smart in how it grabs those little bits of information, combines them to give a, a likelihood for a single candidate key. OK. So if we circle around to evaluation and we consider rank now, we have some interesting questions. Um, and an example of one is this. So if you have an attack that requires 10,000 measurements and some, some rank left over afterwards, and an attack that requires five times more measurements, but requires less brute force work afterwards, uh, which is better? And I think the answer actually is it really does depend on, firstly, on how many or how long it takes to get measurements, how difficult it is, and also on how difficult the enumeration is. So at this point, there has been some work done by people who do evaluations on how to, how to make use of rank, or how to incorporate rank into evaluations. Um, where we started with this work was you know, to say, kind of do the obvious thing and say, well, uh, the rank is a random variable defined over the randomness in a fixed number of measurements. So if you pick an attack strategy, pick a fixed number of measurements, and run the attack several times using different freshly gathered uh, acquisitions, you'll have different ranks come out. And the interesting question is, well, how different will these ranks be? And then you might ask, well, can we analytically compute this distribution? Because um, th that would be nice, nice and straightforward. Um, but the answer is, unfortunately, no. Um, if you are happy to make a lot of assumptions, uh, then you could do this, although no one has yet. Um, but in practice, if I gave someone a device tomorrow and said, uh, compute this distribution, let's see what it looks like, uh, they wouldn't be able to do it. 
And then the second interesting question is, in side channel literature, we normally care about averages or expectations. So success is normally defined as an average. How many times will I succeed on average? And, and so a good question is how is looking at the expectation of this rank uh, a good idea? Okay, so if no analytical approach is available, the only, this essentially collapses to a pure statistics problem. The only option you have left is to estimate the distribution uh, via repeated sampling. So uh, what this means in practice is you have to fix your strategy, fix number of measurements, uh, gather a fresh set of measurements each time, run the attack, and estimate the rank. And so questions we wanted to kind of answer were, what does the distribution of the rank actually look like? And secondly, in side channel analysis, I don't know if you've ever been to a chess conference, but you'll see hundreds of hundreds of different ways of constructing attacks, ranging from very, very complicated machine learning techniques that only apply in kind of niche scenarios to very, very simple um, general attacks that require as, as little as subtracting the mean of two data sets. And so we wanted to ask, well, it, does the distribution to rank look the same for, for attacks that follow wildly different strategies? Okay, but before I go into the results, actually the first thing we want uh, as people doing evaluations is a way to, well, essentially a way to not have to check every single key in turn. Uh, as, as evaluators, you don't want to be doing uh, this every single time you uh, want to work out the rank of an attack. But because we know the key, uh, we can use that information to basically get a fast approximation for the rank actually is. So starting from, I guess, Euro 2013, people have tried to define methods for doing this. The majority provided an interval estimate. And actually, at AsiaCrypt last year, one of my colleagues, Dan, uh, described an algorithm that provides a point estimate. And this is one we like, and we think it's fast and accurate. And as part of this work, we spent a bit of time trying to make it, make it better. Um, so to quickly uh, describe what we did, we made essentially several observations that reduced the, that reduced the runtime of it. And this allowed us to achieve um, quite a few orders of magnitude more precision and no additional runtime. And actually, the interesting thing here is that the observations we made didn't actually reduce the algorithmic complexity um, asymptotically. Um, so it kind of shows that constants are important. And um, what this means in practice is that you can get a very accurate point estimate in at most a few seconds on a, on a reasonably powerful workstation CPU. OK, so the first thing we found, well, the first, the first thing we did was essentially run hundreds of thousands of millions of attacks uh, on, the, on our university uh, computing, computing cluster. And we basically varied everything. Uh, from noise levels, uh, attack strategies, numbers of measurements, and so on. And the kind of interesting thing we found was that the distribution of this rank doesn't really change, or is it independent of all these things. And essentially, the, if you take a, you know, attack strategy A, which uses a small number of traces, attack strategy B, which is cleverer, sorry, which is, which is less clever, but uses more traces, um, those attacks will produce a very similar looking distribution if they kind of do equally as well. So good attacks that produce low ranks produce distributions that look the same. And bad attacks that produce um, high ranks, uh, that have high ranks, also have distributions that look similar. Uh, we don't know why this is. This is where this analytical route might be uh, uh, useful. So in this work, we stuck to trying to improve the evaluation process. Um, but that is definitely something to look into. So this is an example of what uh, the kind of eva evaluation that you can do. So we took a data set produced by uh, one of my colleagues at Bristol, uh, which was published at CHES 2015, uh, which is a DPA attack on a fairly difficult target, so a, a device implementing AES and hardware. 
and where the uh, tax strategy was uh, uh, for those that are interested is just a straightforward correlation power analysis uh, using EM measurements. So we had maybe, uh, I think, in the order of a few million traces. We took small subsets of those traces randomly, uh, ran the same exact same attack that these guys did, and estimated the rank. And that's what you can see plotted on this graph. So if I wear the kind of hat of an evaluator under the kind of, what well, I said was the current way of doing things, uh, the interesting part is kind of down here or here, which is where the attacker starts kind of winning perfectly. Um, on average, this is around 80,000 traces. Um, but the adversary starts getting in, you know, a luckily perfect attack at around about 50,000 traces. And in fact, this is what uh, my, my colleague Jake reported in his paper. Now, if you take rank into account, and let's assume that, I don't know, uh, we want 80 bits of security in some sense, um, which is this horizontal line here. The adversary actually starts beating that, starts winning. On average, here, um, and I kind of wish I'd drawn lines now, but that's about 20,000 traces. And actually, 10% of the time, it actually wins uh, somewhere between 10,000 and 15,000 traces. Uh, so that's kind of, those, those are quite big gaps in the number of measurements at which maybe you, you define success. Another interesting thing to look at is the kind of distribution side on. Um, so this is a histogram of repeated attacks um, where the average rank after the attack was 2 to the 16. So also that, that's good for the adversary. That, I mean, that, that costs them nothing to enumerate. And you can see that the distribution looks, looks kind of normal. Um, you have a little um, bit of censorship going on on the left-hand side, um, because obviously you can't do better than rank 0 or rank 1, depending on how you define it. But you can see there's, uh, there is still a fair bit of variance going on. On average, you know, 2 to 16 is really easy. A lot of the time, I win perfectly, but sometimes I have to do more than 2 to the 40 work afterwards. And if you make these attacks slightly worse, uh, you can see the distribution start to spread a bit more. And I think this is the most interesting one, um, where on average, the attacker has to do 2 to 64 enumeration work, uh, which is a lot. Um, I think the most we've ever done in, in, uh, in our lab is 2 to the 50, and that took um, 700 calls for one day. But some of the time, I don't know what the percentages are, but maybe 10% of the time, it's actually quite easy. We're doing maybe 2 to 45. And I don't know, 25, 30% of the time, the adversary is totally screwed. It has to be more than 2 to the 80. So this suggests, well, it seems pretty obvious that you perhaps shouldn't look at averages. And essentially, the best thing to do is to define a threshold and look at when your uh, distribution tail crosses that threshold. And if I keep going, you can see, see how this uh, normal distribution shape continues. OK. So our proposal for how evaluation should be done now, if you care about rank, is essentially to collapse it to a, a statistics problem. It's the only kind of way to do things, uh, which requires repeated sampling from the distribution uh, for an attack. In terms of statistics, um, this large variance, uh, which is, I guess actually I didn't mention this, kind of in the positions, the unfortunate positions in which you're most interested. So as I'm guessing as a, as a manufacturer, you're probably going to be interested in when ranks are around 2 to 60, 2 to 70, maybe even 2 to 80. And this is where the distribution has the most variance. So consequently, we suggest that uh, non-parametric order statistics, such as percentiles, uh, kind of make, let you make a lot more actionable conclusions. 
um, such as the, the, the one I've kind of said here. One thing I haven't discussed here is, but is in the paper, is, is how many repeat experiments you should do. And we kind of heuristically arrived at 30, ideally more. Um, this isn't great, because uh, it does require these evaluators to gather a lot more measurements. Um, you might be able to do something slightly clever uh, with repeated, sorry, with reusing some, some of your measurements, but you also need to be careful. But unfortunately, this is currently the only option we have. So I'd just like to point out, we implemented this estimation algorithm and the improvements we described. Um, and we also have an implementation of the, the enumeration step for an adversary, um, which is uh, designed to run on a lot of cores. And that's available at that URL. Uh, it's written in C++. It's a header in your library, so you can integrate it fairly easily. Um, it has tests. Uh, comments, uh, examples, and uh, it's free to use, so please do. And uh, any questions about it, uh, please talk to me. And so, with that, I'll conclude. And thanks for listening. I'll thank the speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. In many cases, uh, you can take. Uh, both the uh, first subkey and the last subkey by doing encryptions and decryptions uh, inside channel attacks, and you get two different rankings. Now, assuming that uh, they are related, the first and the last key, for example, uh, there are permutations of uh, bit positions, that's the only difference between the first and the last uh, key. Could you uh, uh, devise a, a better algorithm for doing ranking if you have a ranking over a uh, the uh, key bits in one order and the ranking over the key bits in another order. You see what I mean? So essentially it's a structure that you can exploit given exactly. the algorithm you're targeting. For example, in DES, the first subkey and the last subkey are just permutations of each other. Yeah, um, that would be interesting. Um, but yeah, have a try, yeah. Uh, any other questions? <laughs> So, follow up on, on the question. Uh, so, I wonder you know, to what extent your analysis would apply and recommendations would apply to other ciphers. Mm. Uh, your, recommendation, uh, your analysis was done for AES, right? So, how do you think it would apply to other types of ciphers, maybe lightweight mm. ciphers? So, I, off the top of my head, I think everything we tried was AES. Um, Given kind of existing non-rank based research into other ciphers, I would not expect any difference. Um, I would still expect this kind of shape just to shrunk um, depending on the, the, the key size and that would literally be all I, all I would expect to see. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>